and welcome to Living a Totally Healthy Life on Total Health TV. I'm so glad you are joining us today because we have a wonderful conversation with Dr. Ronnie Bannock, who is a board certified ophthalmologist. And also she's specializing in an integrative approach to vision health. And she is the author of a brand new book called The Macular Degeneration Prevention Protocol. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Ronnie Bannock to the show. Hello, Ronnie. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Well, it's great having you and congratulations on your new book. I know it's a little delayed, so we will look forward to seeing it as soon as it comes out. I think it's later this summer, I believe. Yes. yes. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Um, yes. Fingers crossed. This is such an important topic because our eyes are really being challenged these days. And if there's one sense, you don't want to lose any of your faculties, but if there's one sense you do not want to lose, it's your eyesight. So we need to be more informed and educated about what challenges our eyesight, what contributes to things like macular degeneration, cataracts, uh, and and the strategies, the preventative strategies that I know we're going to have a really in-depth conversation about, and also hope so people know that there are ways if they are showing signs of these conditions can begin the process of mitigating or even reversing them. So uh, I'm thrilled we're having this conversation today. Let's begin by talking about the challenges that we're facing from the situation that's occurring presently, and I'm talking about the COVID-19, you have some interesting insights about the virus and our eyes. So let's begin there. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's a very timely topic. Um, so the virus uh, can potentially spread through the eyes. It's pretty rare that that would happen, but it can potentially get into our bodies through the mucous membranes of the eyes because our mucous membranes have ACE2 receptors, which are also found in the lungs and other respiratory mucosa. So uh, that's why hand washing is so important. So you know, if you touch something and you have to touch your eyes or rub your eyes, make sure you wash your hands before and after you touch your eyes. And the virus can also spread through the tears of the eyes. So again, if you have to rub your you know, rub your eyes, touch your eyes, make sure you wash your hands. And it's best that you try not to touch and rub. And I know it's difficult because it's also allergy season right now, but you just have to be very, very cautious about that. But um, I would say my, my bigger concern, rather than the spread of the virus through the eyes, my bigger concern with vision and COVID-19 is our shift to much more digital screen time. And before this pandemic even happened, uh, many of us were spending hours and hours a day in front of a screen. Uh, it's very interesting, the numbers uh, in, in terms of the average number of hours a U.S. adult was spent on a screen before the pandemic, it was estimated to be about 11 hours a day in front of a screen. And that includes uh, computers, laptops, tablets, phones, television. So I mean, that's a tremendous amount of time even, even prior to the pandemic. And for children, the estimated amount of time was about six hours a day in front of a screen. So again, that creates a lot of eye issues. Um, in terms of a syndrome called digital eye strain and blue light exposure, which um, which we can talk about. But now that you know we're in this pandemic mode, many of us had had to shift to working from home. Our children are homeschooling. Uh, we're connecting with our friends and family via screens, and we're also probably watching more TV and streaming using screens. So those numbers are going to skyrocket even more. I can't even imagine what those numbers are going to end up like look, looking like um, during the pandemic. So it, it's a concern. Well, I think it's a big concern because I actually have been investigating the effects of our screens and the blue light, the frequency that's emitted from the screens and its impact on our health and our thinking and our vision. Uh, so I want to go into this in more depth because I think it is a topic that people need to really understand and the consequences from exposure without the right protection. So can we begin by talking about blue light let maybe just maybe back up even further let's talk about the eyes and what happens with light coming into the eyes yeah so great question so eye anatomy is uh it's quite complex actually there are many different structures of the eye but whenever light comes through the eye it first has to pass through the cornea which is the clear 
curved surface of the eye, and then it passes through the lens, which we all have a natural lens inside our eyes, which helps us to focus, has to pass through there, and then it goes to the back of the eye and hits the retina, which is a very complex structure. It's nine cell layers thick, and it processes that light, and it changes that light energy into electrical energy, and then that electrical energy gets carried through the optic nerve to the brain that processes all this light information, and the brain is actually what creates an image. So again, it's a, it's a very multi-step pathway. And so whenever a light hits our eyes, no matter what type of light it is, it has to go through all these various structures. And uh, in terms of the different wavelengths of light that are important to think about in terms of um, eye health and, and preserving eye health, we need to really protect against UV rays as well as blue light rays. Now, um, I'll just very briefly just describe the UV rays that, that are there, and then we'll talk more about blue light. So uh, in terms of UV rays, they, they come from the sun. There are three types, UVA, B, and C. Our atmosphere blocks out most of the C rays, which is the shortest wavelength, so that's, that's protective. But the UVA and B rays can get into our eyes. And fortunately, much of that light is blocked by, it's absorbed by the cornea or the lens, so it's not actually hitting our retina. But there's a very small portion that can hit our retina and potentially cause eye issues. And they've, it's been linked with um, uh, cataracts, for example, as well as some retinal conditions. So it is important to protect against UV rays. That, could, that are coming from the sun. Now, let's talk a little bit more about blue light. So blue light is part of the visible spectrum of light. If you think of the, col the rainbow of colors, it's on one end of the rainbow and red is on the other end. And blue light is high energy, short wavelength light. And uh, if you were to think about the wavelengths, it's actually between 400 to 500 nanometers, which is a billionth of a meter. They're tiny, tiny little rays of light. And um, and in terms of how our eyes filter this blue light, so yes, the lens can filter some of it, but much much of it actually gets to the retina in the back of our eyes. And um, the blue light that, that we're exposed to, we're actually exposed to it all day long, and it comes from multiple sources. So the sun is the greatest emitter of blue light, so natural blue light is coming from the sun, and it's very important for our health because it signals to our bodies uh, in terms of when the sun rises, it's, it sends a signal to our body to wake up. It's time to get started with the day. It helps to regulate our circadian rhythm or sleep-wake pattern. And then as the sun traverses across the sky and then it begins to set, there's less blue light that's coming out from the sun and it's signaling to our bodies that, okay, it's time to wind down, it's time to get ready for bed. And then melatonin, which is a sleep hormone, is uh, it rises in terms of its level. So again, there's a natural cycle of blue light that's coming from the sun. But blue light is also coming, we're exposed to blue light from many artificial sources uh, in, our, in our lives. So blue light comes from our screens, again, any kind of screen, whether it's a TV monitor, computer monitor, laptop, phone, all of those screens emit blue light. And also, a lot of people don't realize this, blue light also comes from certain types of bulbs, light bulbs. And many of us have now switched to CFL bulbs, which are compact fluorescent bulbs. We've also switched to LED bulbs, light emitting diode bulbs, because they save energy. But these bulbs emit much more blue light than incandescent or fluorescent lights. So that's another source of blue light. And this artificial blue light can really interrupt that natural circadian rhythm and make it, studies have shown that blue light exposure, particularly close to bedtime, about two hours before bedtime, can really make it much more difficult to fall asleep and stay asleep. So that's one health concern in terms of blue light. And then there are the eye issues as well. So let's just stay with blue light a little bit. What I, what I learned, which was so you know, shocking actually, when we talk about blue light, because you know, the last, you know, really the last 10 years, everyone's been glued to their computers, their tablets, their phones, and maybe a little bit longer, but it's a relatively new phenomenon as humans that we're spending 11 hours, and I'm probably very guilty of that, Ronnie, right? And Myself um, included. Right, because that's, you know, you work at home and you're, you know, consulting, whatever. It's everything is through the computer or through your phone. But what I had no understanding of before is the frequency of the light emitted by computers and how, which is what we're calling a, spe a specific spectrum. It's found in nature, usually around midday during the daytime. And that, that range of the light waves disappears as we go into sunset. So it's designed to stimulate us to be alive during the day, midday, that's what we want. But 
when blue light becomes a part of our evening exposure, again, never happened before in the history of humanity, we are spending hours giving the signal to our brain that we're midday and it could be 11 o'clock at night. So because as you said, the brain is taking in the light and processing it and initiating cycles and circadian rhythms and God knows how many, I would say all the functions of our body are ruled by light in one way or another. We're we're giving a wrong message and there are consequences to that message if we continue to have blue light. And you know what I hate too, those mercury vapor lights on cars now, the, the white lights that many, mm -hmm. many manufacturers of cars are using, they're blinding, they hurt my eyes as opposed to the more mm -hmm. yellow, the you know, incandescent ones. And street lights mm -hmm. are also blue. I mean, blue light, we become a blue light world. Exactly. What, you know, what, so what are your, it's, so, it's so let's talk. Get... Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I try to have, um, in the evening I have like, uh, a Himalayan salt lamp, which puts out a dim glow of red or, um, just lower levels of light in my evening, uh, space here. So I'm not exposed to that blue light at night. I do my best and we can talk about glasses as well. Um, first let's, let's dive into what are your concerns? What are you seeing in your practice as an ophthalmologist from people having this 11 hours of ex screen, ex screen exposure for adults, six hours for children? What do you see in your practice? Yeah, so one of the most common conditions I see is something called digital eye strain, and I had alluded to this before. So what digital eye strain is, it's a, it's a constellation of symptoms that can happen from excessive screen time or screen exposure and blue light exposure. And these symptoms include difficulty focusing, blurry vision, dry eye, light sensitivity, headaches, and sometimes even neck and shoulder pain. And um, it, again, it really has to do very directly, it's a very direct relationship in terms of the amount of time spent on a screen and digital eye strain. Now, digital eye strain also can be known as, um, as computer vision syndrome. Some people refer to it as computer vision syndrome. It's all the same. And um, you know, these are, are short-term side effects of excessive screen time and blue light exposure. Now, fortunately, there is no data to suggest that there's any long-term damage done by blue light. So, I do want to just mention that there was a study published in 2018 which raised some alarms about blue light. And I think the title was, you know, the blue light from our screens is going to be blinding us. And I just want to talk a little bit about that study and break it down a little because it's not true. There is, again, no evidence that blue light will cause permanent damage to our retinas in our eyes. And so let me explain about what that study was, what they did. So the researchers took some cells, put them in a Petri dish, and exposed them to very, very high levels of blue light. And lo and behold, those cells died. They didn't live. And so the researchers concluded that blue light will kill our eyes and kill our retinal cells. So the cells that they put in the Petri dish were actually not even retinal cells. They were cervical cancer cells. And the reason why they chose those cells is because those cells grow very well in a Petri dish. They grow very well in culture. But they don't have the natural protective mechanisms that our eyes have to protect against blue light. And so it's important to keep that in perspective. Yes. That study was done. It was done in a lab. It was not done in a human being. Our human eye has protective pigments in the back of our eyes that help protect against blue light. It actually absorbs and neutralizes that blue light. So um, I'd love to talk a little bit more about those natural blue light blockers that are actually inside our eyes because they're so important. And I think many people don't realize that we have these protective pigments in our eyes and we need to support them. Um, and make sure that we have plenty of them to really have safeguard our retinas. Oh, I'd love for you to do that. But before I go there, I just have one other question to ask you. Um, the exposure to blue light, which is good news that so far, so far we don't have any studies of long-term damage, but who knows as people watch, you know, from their screens and are on their screens more and more from times of being children all the way up. We don't have that data because we haven't lived that long, right? But um, yeah, so it'll take decades to get that data. So right, yeah. yeah. So I hopefully, hopefully, you're, you know, the the preliminary data is encouraging. 
I wouldn't bet on it, but I'm encouraged for the moment. But um, before we go into the blue light and, and ways to protect your eyes, I'd like us to talk a little bit more about um, the effects of blue light regarding certain circadian rhythms like sleep and how the blue light could be contributing to a huge epidemic of insomnia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what blue light actually does in the retina is that it stimulates melanopsin cells. There are photoreceptor cells in the retina that capture this blue light, and those melanopsin cells are directly linked with the pineal gland, which is deep within our brain. And the pineal gland is responsible for regulating our sleep-wake cycle or circadian rhythm. So when we are exposed to that blue light, particularly at night, when after the sun has set, um, we basically, we, that melatonin release is suppressed because those melanopsin cells are activated or they continue to be activated. So it's really a very, it's, it's a, a you know, kind of a complex pathway, but the bottom line is that it really disrupts our sleep-wake cycle. It can definitely lead to insomnia and again, also difficulty staying asleep. So once someone falls asleep, oftentimes there are multiple awakenings that people can have. And there are numerous studies that have shown these associations between uh, uh, blue light exposure at late into the evening hours and difficulty with sleep patterns as well. And it's very interesting, there was also, there's also been some preliminary work done in children where uh, these studies have shown that when children are exposed, young children are exposed to high levels of blue light, it can also lead to behavioral issues, for example, hyperactivity and perhaps even cognitive issues as well. So we need to be particularly careful with children because their eyes simply are, they're still developing, they don't filter out blue light as well as adult eyes do. Well, that's a huge concern for our children because we're seeing toddlers go on phones and tablets and be entertained, I and mean, that's an experiment right there. Exactly, yes, and, uh, and we won't know the long-term effects for, for a very long time. Um, I, I do want to mention that uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics had uh, released screen time guidelines for children, and these were released back in 2016. And for children under the age of two, it was recommended they really have no screen time whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And uh, up until the age of, let's say, between three to five, only about one hour a day, and then five to 12, two hours maximum a day. And th these are all numbers that, you know, that were recommended back in 2016. So of course now, uh, especially during the pandemic, all those numbers are just out the window. So, um, you know, our children, even before the pandemic, were probably getting much more exposure to screen time than the recommended amounts. But, well, you know, who knows now, you know, with them homeschooling and, you know, much, you know, so there's so much more interaction that's happening, happening virtually with their friends, with their family, gaming. Um, it's, you know, those numbers are just skyrocketing. And we don't know what impact it's going to have on their, not only their developing eyes, but also their developing brains as well. This is such a big wake up call, this conversation that we're having to make people aware of what's going on. I don't think most people really understand some of the consequences, the unintended consequences from our technology. So let's talk about ways to protect our eyes and protect our eyes, especially from any effects or, or harm, dysfunction, <laughs> whatever uh, yeah. that may happen from blue light. Yeah, so, um, so I, I think this is perhaps the most important topic uh, that, that I can uh, educate people about is what can you do to protect your eyes? You know, the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that's my motto, that's my philosophy, and that's what I really strongly advocate for my practice or patients in my practice. So, you know, many of my patients will ask me, you know, I'm on screens all day, should I be getting blue blocking glasses, you know, or what kind of blue blocker should I get? What I tell them is that there are actually natural ways to protect against blue light because we have these pigments in the back of our eyes. These pigments are called macular um, carotenoids and there are three pigments that are, that are deposited in the back of our eyes. They're called lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. And these pigments are, again, they're antioxidants, but they actually absorb that blue light and neutralize it and prevent it from causing ha dar uh, harm or damage to our retinas. And the question is, where can you find these pigments? How do we get them? So our bodies, unfortunately, cannot make these pigments. Uh, we cannot produce them internally, so we need to get them externally. And there are two ways to get them. Number one, I would say, is nutrition, proper nutrition. And we can go through what some of those foods are that have these essential pigments. And then the second way is supplementation. 
So uh, in terms of nutrition, lutein and zeaxanthin, the first two compounds that I mentioned, are found best in green leafy vegetables. Uh, so for example, spinach, kale, any kind of greens, whether it's collard greens, mustard greens, dandelion greens, they're all rich in both lutein and zeaxanthin. Zeaxanthin is um, also found in orange and yellow fruits and vegetables. So for example, orange and yellow peppers, uh, various types of squash, um, as well as corn are rich in zeaxanthin. And um, the, unfortunately, the third pigment that I had mentioned, mesozeaxanthin, is not abundantly found in foods. It's actually a little tricky to find that in foods. So that's, um, that particular pigment is very difficult to get from diet alone. In terms of how much of these pigments we should have in our diet, the recommended amounts, depending on which study you read, are anywhere between, for lutein, anywhere between 6 to 20 milligrams a day. And for zeaxanthin, about one to two milligrams a day. Now, unfortunately, most of us um, who are on some kind of a Western diet are not even getting close to those recommended amounts. So it's estimated that adults are probably getting uh, less than one to two milligrams of lutein a day when they're supposed to be getting six to 20. And uh, in terms of zeaxanthin, most people are getting less than one milligram a day. So we are subpar in terms of our nutrition uh, and getting these essential uh, pigmented nutrients in our diet. And mesozeaxanthin, again, is not readily found in diet. So that's where supplementation, I think, really plays a major role, especially now because our, our society is so uh, dependent on digital devices. I mean, it's impossible to get away from them, adults and children alike. So that's why supplementation is key. And you know, when you're looking for a supplement, there are many out there on the market. There's about 40 or 50 different eye health supplements that I actually researched for my book when I was writing about this. You know, what is the bioavailability of these supplements? You know, what are the different combinations that are best? Um, you know, for what disorders are they best? And what I found is that there is an ingredient uh, out there in many of the supplements that actually combines all three of these pigments in the natural ratio that's found in the back of our eye. And that ingredient is called Ludamax 2020. And again, it's found in many of the supplements out there. You just have to look for the label. Um, I actually have, um, this, is, this is a brand that I use myself, and it actually says uh, Ludamax, I don't know if you can see it on the label, but Ludamax 2020, and then you see it on the back as well. Um, so look for that, you know, that ingredient, because it will provide you with those three pigments that you need in the quantity and ratio that your eyes need to stay healthy. And I, you know, there are, again, many supplements out there. There are even some that are gummy forms, which are great for children. Um, I know it's hard enough to get children to have some of those fruits and vegetables that are rich in these pigments. So um, I, I do think that especially for kids, a daily supplement is best. I actually give it to my daughter. She loves them. You know, it's, it's, they taste good. It's almost like popping candy. So, uh, so she'd much rather have that than, than have some of the other fruits and vegetables, even though I try to combine both uh, to protect, to help protect her eyes as well. Well, that's great because I take an eye supplement every day and uh, which contains the zeaxanthin and the lutein. I have to see about your the, the, the special formulated one that you just mentioned. But um, I think everyone should be taking a good eye supplement because our eyes are really under a lot of strain these days and we really need to protect them. And a supplement is a critical, I think it's critical. It, it forms uh, a foundation of my protocol. That I do yeah, every day. Absolutely. So I'm, I do I'm the glad same. to. I recommend a daily supplement for for most of my patients. And um, you know, again, most of the supplements will not have all three. So you need to look for all three of those nutrients uh, on the label uh, to get that full protection. Mesozeaxanthin, that third pigment, is actually thought to be the the most potent in terms of um, an antioxidant in the retina. So it's really important to get that one. Well, wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. Let's talk about macular degeneration, since that's the topic of your book, and obviously you have researched it you know, <laughs> into the greatest depth possible. Um, what is yes. it? What causes it? And then what do we need to do to prevent ourselves from going there? Because that is a serious problem when people start getting into their 60s, 70s, and beyond. I don't know if you're seeing younger people showing up with macula, but um, certainly it's a condition that happens for uh, people who are seniors, senior citizens in our world. Let's talk about it. Absolutely. So macular degeneration is unfortunately one of the leading causes of blindness 
um, not only in the U.S., but in the world as well. And it's estimated that about 11 million people have been diagnosed with macular degeneration in the United States alone. And that's more than uh, other neurodegenerative conditions combined, so more than Alzheimer's and Parkinson's combined. And macular degeneration is considered, even though it's an eye issue, it is considered a neurodegenerative disease because our eye is an extension of our brain. And so uh, what happens in macular degeneration, you're absolutely correct, it tends to affect people who are older, usually um, 60 or 70 or above. Very rarely does it affect people who are younger than that. Um, Though there is a juvenile form as well, it's pretty uncommon. Usually the older age groups are more affected. And there are other risk factors as well. So there are many, many genetic markers that have been identified for macular degeneration. I would say over 50 genes have been identified so far that are linked with macular degeneration. But what many of these genes do, we still don't completely understand. So just because you may have a gene for it, let's say you take a genetic test like 23andMe and you, you, you have the gene for macular degeneration, doesn't necessarily mean that you will get this potentially blinding condition. But let me also explain what it is. So it's a disease of the retina. And what happens is that in the beginning, there is oxidative stress to the retina. So basically, there's damage to cell membranes, there's damage to DNA, there's damage to mitochondria through oxidation. And then um, mitochondria don't function properly, and they begin to form some deposits underneath the retina. And these deposits are called drusen. And drusen is the German word for pebble or stone. And so these little deposits look like yellowish white little pebbles that we can see in the retina. And drusen alone don't cause vision loss. So yes, they're there. It's a precursor to macular degeneration, but it doesn't necessarily mean that someone will progress to macular degeneration. What happens is the more drusen people develop, the more th that what happens is there's inflammation that develops around the drusen, ultimately, there, is, there are many uh, chemicals that are released. Uh, there's something called VEGF, which is released, called, and it's called vascular endothelial growth factor, and that stimulates blood vessel formation. So blood vessels begin to grow under the retina, into the retina, and these blood vessels are not normal, and they bleed, and they leak. And so um, I don't know if you're familiar with the term leaky gut. I know many uh, people who are in the functional integrative space are, are very familiar with leaky gut syndrome. I like to call macular degeneration a leaky eye syndrome because ultimately what happens is there is blood and fluid and proteins that go into the retina which should not be there. So all these are leaking because of the root cause of oxidative stress and inflammation. And what happens with, uh, in terms of symptoms, in the very beginning stages when there are just drusen um, and there's no fluid, uh, many people oftentimes are completely asymptomatic, but as they progress on to the more advanced stages of, of the disease, when fluid begins to develop, people may lose their central vision. So imagine where you have a dark spot, a central dark spot that's blocking your vision. You can still see around it, but in the center, it's kind of a grayish blur or distortion. And so this is very, very debilitating because people cannot do their normal activities. Uh, many things that they would normally take for granted, they can no longer do. For example, read, drive, work, see the faces of their loved ones. I mean, it's a very devastating disease because it affects central vision. And the good thing is not everyone goes on to the advanced stages of macular degeneration. Only about 10% of people who are diagnosed with it will go on to the advanced stage. So that's why prevention is so, so critical. And that's really what my book focuses on is prevention of macular degeneration with a proper diet, meaning plenty of antioxidants, those three macular carotenoids that I had mentioned before, um, and omega-3 fatty acids because those are very, very important for retinal health um, and protecting retinal cell, cell membranes. And then there are a number of lifestyle factors as well that need to be taken into consideration for prevention of macular degeneration. So smoking is a major risk factor. Um, obesity is a risk factor. Um, and, and there are many others as well, which I discuss in my book. Well, it sounds like macular degeneration is just another manifestation of how we have compromised our health from the choices we do in our diet or what we're exposed to in our environment that's generating massive amounts of inflammation and oxidative stress. And it's, you know, those small little capillaries that go into the eyes really get blocked. So it's just, you know, it's, it's what we're doing to ourselves based on the poor choices we've made and exposures that we've had. So I would imagine it's increasing 
the incidence of macula is increasing in the population. It, am I right? Is it? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's definitely the trend is going steeply uphill and it's estimated by the year 2050, there'll be um, 50 million people diagnosed with macular degeneration in the U.S. alone. Wow. And again, it, age is a risk factor, but it's not the only risk factor. I mean, there are so many other uh, uh, modifiable risk factors that we can we can intervene with in terms of prevention. So um, I think, you know, the, the key is, is to get in there before the window of intervention is lost. Really can it be thing. reversed? Can it be reversed or can it be mitigated? Can it be slowed? Well, some once, people once believe it's that yes, with proper diet and uh, modification of lifestyle factors that sometimes the drusen can be resorbed. Um, now, the treatments that are out there that are FDA approved for macular degeneration are only for the advanced form of macular degeneration where there's already bleeding in the eye. And those treatments are injections into the eye. And, you know, it's kind of a, it's a terrifying thought to get an injection into your eye. But with those treatments, sometimes vision loss can be reversed. But again, the goal is not to get to that stage, you know, to try to prevent it before it gets to that, you know, very advanced stage of leaky eye. And um, even though some of the vision loss can be reversed, there's still scar tissue that remains. So vision never 100% goes back to normal. And um, again, I can't underscore the importance of proper diet and lifestyle for prevention. Well, it's an important message, definitely an important message. So have you seen people who you've, your patients who have followed your protocol and your recommendations improve things like macular degeneration? Yeah, so um, so I have, I've uh, walked many people through this, this protocol, and um, the goal is to stabilize their vision loss. So let's say they have drusen, they're developing more and more drusen. My goal is to prevent them from developing drusen to the point where they'll develop leaky eye syndrome. And yes, I have been able to, by completely turning around some patients' diets, um, you know, some of my patients come in and they're on a, a standard American diet, also known as the SAD diet, which is very pro-inflammatory, um, you know, unhealthy fats, high in simple sugars, processed foods. So by making simple changes like that, it can really halt the progression of the disease. And not only that, not only does it help eye health, but these important diet changes, dietary changes, and lifestyle modifications also improve overall health. So it's not just protecting your vision, it's also thinking about your entire wellness, your, your overall health. You know, I've been able to get my, some of my patients um, off their blood pressure medications or reducing their, um, their insulin level or their diabetic medication. So that to me is a big win. So not only stabilizing their eye disease, but helping their general health as well. And I would imagine diabetes or pre-diabetes conditions are major factors that lead to eye issues like macular degeneration because it's an inflammatory condition. Yeah, so diabetes, um, it hasn't yet been proven as an independent risk factor for macular degeneration, but high blood pressure has been. Uh, diabetes on its, on its own can actually cause a different eye condition called diabetic retinopathy, which is also quite debilitating and potentially blinding. So absolutely blood sugar control is key, reducing your intake of pro-inflammatory foods, and promoting what I call a plant-rich diet. So it doesn't have to be a plant-based diet, it doesn't have to be vegan or vegetarian, but a plant-rich diet where you're getting all of these phytonutrients that will help protect your retinas against oxidative stress and damage. So the real message, as all messages when it comes to regaining your health, is you know start making the changes that you need to support a healthy body and to support all of your systems in this case, especially our eyes, by making those proper choices, getting rid of all the toxic foods, the fatty, the, you know, the fried foods, the sugary foods, the refined carbohydrates, going back to real food again. And I think you absolutely need supplementation to support that process. Don't, don't you agree with that? Absolutely. I agree. Yes. Yeah. Anything we can do yeah. to protect our eyes. You know, our vision is so precious. Many of us take it for granted, but when something goes wrong, then we realize how valuable it really is. So the goal is to prevent things from going wrong. That, that's my motto. So one last thing I'd like to ask. I want to go back to blue light. Do you recommend people change the, uh, the color of their screens at night? Because you, you have that setting that can turn it out of the blue and go into nighttime, more of a yellow uh, color on the screen. Yes. You can get programs that can change the blue lights 
on your computer screen. I think one of them is i.flux. I, I no, plus, um, the free yes, one. There are, there are um, two apps that can actually internally block out that blue light. One of the apps is called Iris, and the other one is called Flux, which is F dot L U X. Um, That's the I one. actually yeah. prefer Iris because it has uh, it has a lot more versatility. There are twenty seven different settings on Iris, so depending on where you know your your needs, what time of day it is, you can adjust the setting for your comfort level and. Um, you know, I, I like to use healthy setting because that setting mo it mirrors the natural sunlight cycle in the sky. So basically it knows the time zone that you're in and it will adjust the blue light to match what's being emitted by the sun at that, at that latitude. So um, that's, that's my favorite app. Uh, there are other ways to block blue light. You know, we, we talked briefly about blue blocking glasses. Um, just a word of caution about blue blockers, not all of them are made the same. Uh, there are different grades of blue blocking filters. So, you know, if you really want to achieve the best, you know, um, blue blocker for your vision at nighttime, put the glasses on, take a look at your screen. If you can still see the color blue on your screen, it means that it's not truly blocking all of that blue light. So you're still getting some of that blue light in. So, you know, just talk to your optician about which type of blue blocker may be best for you. And if you really want to block out all the blue light, get something that's a very, very dark tint that will block out that blue light from your screen. Oh, good the other advice. Great I have a... is people can use... Go ahead. Go ahead. Then I'll have, uh, yeah. <laughs> I have so, one more question. So, um... Go ahead first. Yeah. So uh, the other great tip that I, I usually give my patients is in your bedroom, try to get smart bulbs because these smart bulbs will automatically, again, uh, take out that blue light depending on the time of day it is or whatever you set it to. So uh, it will give more of a reddish orange glow at, at, in the evening mm -hmm. rather than a blue green kind of tint to your light. So um, I, we have those in our in our household also that are smart, smart bulbs, which you can just buy on Amazon or, or at your hardware store. Oh, that's a great tip. I never heard of smart bulbs before. That's wonderful. So mm -hmm. they change, they, they are block, they don't emit the blue light at night. Wow. They're just called smart right. bulbs. Yes. Okay. Yeah. They're called smart bulbs. I have one bulbs. more question. Mm -hmm. So I have these glasses that I made up a year ago at my opticians and I asked, they put in a blue blocking uh, filter. They said, there's mm -hmm. no evidence that it works. I said, we'll put it in any way. Is there any evidence that it's helpful in any way, shape or form, or is it more just my belief systems? So uh, there are some studies that have, that have been done that have shown that people who, um, who wear blue blockers, they're definitely much more comfortable in front of screens. Uh, and they have a, a shorter sleep latency time. So uh, yes, they can help, but um, again, the tints are all different. There are many manufacturers out there. So, um, you know, if you're looking for complete blue blocking, uh, get a darker tint. Okay. That's great. <laughs> well, this has been fantastic, Ronnie. You've shared so much really valuable information for the audience. Is there anything else that you feel you need to say before we uh, bring this conversation to an end? Well, I think, I think we covered quite a bit and, uh, I'm very happy to be on your show and share this information because I think, again, it's very timely given our reliance on screens. Well, I agree. And I think it's a wake up call for everyone who will be watching to understand that uh, we need to protect our eyes. We need to know what is putting our eyes at risk. And there's some simple things that you suggested that are profound in protecting our eyes. So thank you so much for the great work you're doing. I look forward to getting your book when it's out this yeah, summer absolutely. and uh, and all the best to you and, and your mission in sharing this valuable information out into the world. So thank you so much, Dr. Ronnie Bannock to be with us today. Thank you so much, Cheryl. It was really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And to everyone listening, thank you for joining me for another episode of Living a Totally Healthy Life on Total Health TV. I hope you'll be joining all our episodes. And the best way to do that is go to our Facebook page and go to our YouTube channel because we have lots more great interviews in store for you. So until then, bye for now.